Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Labour and Brexit in the next hour. As far as I can tell, and this is just a mark of how mad everything has become, Labour's new position on Brexit is kind of like the last position, but louder. We'll find out. And listen, I appreciate, I still have a few leftover listeners to this programme who consider any criticism of Jeremy Corbyn to be an act of heresy. Just jog on today. Seriously, this is my country that I'm worried about now. And the leader of the opposition at a time of epic government incompetence is a fair target for criticism, given that the epic government incompetence seems likely to increase rather than decrease under the next prime minister. So what, what is going on? You, you can kid yourself that he's got a flipping Scooby-Doo what he's playing at, at the minute, but you can't kid me. So we'll have a proper look at, in those circumstances, I want to make it clear that Labour would campaign for Remain against either no deal or a Tory deal that does not protect the economy and jobs. Let's have some clarity, Jezza. Oh, OK. In those circumstances, I want to make it clear that Labour would campaign for... Re Sorry, the audience has fallen asleep, mate. What is your position? Well, if there is a general election, then we would... No, no. What is your position right now? I want to make it clear that in those circumstances... Uh, yeah. So we'll be talking about that after 12. A conversation that may be informed by the exchange, or the lesson we're about to be taught by Alex Dean, who's a commissioning editor at the rather splendid Prospect magazine, an organ for people who like thinking. Um, and he has got hold of... Someone whose opinion on WTO terms it could be construed as more important than Marc Francois, um, the bloke that runs the World Trade Organization. Um, and he has asked him, well, I'll let Alex tell you. Alex, it's a fantastic article that you've written. Thank you, first and foremost, for it. I urge everybody to, to buy Prospect or to head over to the website and, and have a read of it. Just, just talk us through its, 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 its central theme. Well, James, thank you very much for having me. Um, the central idea is... Uh, there's been this misinformation about what a no-deal Brexit would really mean, uh, kind of peddled by hardline levers of the J Jacob rees mogg Boris Johnson variety. Um, and there's been a huge amount of pushback against that from mainstream economists, arguing that, in fact, a no-deal Brexit would have very serious consequences indeed. Now, I kind of want to take it <laughs> to, to the next stage mm -hmm. um, and speak to the WTO itself, the WTO is basically this organisation that, um, in the view of some levers, would kind of leap to our rescue in the event of no deal, Correct. and basically everything would be fine. <laughs> well, th th this it's even a hashtag, Alex. It's even a hashtag now, so confident to people in the general population that it's something desirable and to our benefit. Well, I mean, that shows the, um, I mean, on Twitter especially, um, you know, people get into these silos, and I think there is a community out there that thinks that... Um, a no-deal Brexit would be basically a walk in the park. Yeah. So I spoke to figures actually at the WTO to see what they thought. Pascal Lamy was Director General um, for several years, Roberto Azevedo is Director General now, um, and actually what they told me, and these are the figures representing the very institution yes. <laughs> that we'd be falling back on, um, said that actually it would, it would be really problematic going from the situation that we have now to WTO terms. Um, and we should think very carefully indeed before we do that. And people like Boris Johnson, who argue that uh, we can basically you know, have our cake and eat it, even after no deal, it will all be fine. Um, they basically flat contradicted him. <laughs> so I think this is noteworthy that people from the institution itself have weighed into the debate. In, in, in the simplest of terms, what will happen according to their understanding in the event of us leaving without any deal in place. I, I'll put in one precursor to that. GAT24, as people like me have tired of explaining, GAT24 only kicks in when a trade agreement is more or less agreed and it's the interim period before the trade agreement can be properly implemented. And we can't have a trade agreement until we've passed the withdrawal agreement and we haven't passed the withdrawal agreement. So I appreciate some people still can't accept this simple truth. But Leaving that aside, if, if come October the 31st we crash out without any deal in place, what does WTO terms mean? I think the best way to understand it is that on economics there's going to be trade barriers erected overnight, um, you know, huge increases in tariffs, also things that people call non-tariff barriers, um, which are things like sanitary checks and regulations basically increased costs to trade um, that could render some businesses literally unviable overnight. And 
even some sectors, uh, you know, if you if you want to uh, kind of be extreme about it, even sectors in agriculture and so on could really struggle simply to survive um, under those circumstances. Simply put, so you'd be looking at 10% on cars that were being exported to, to or imported to the continent and 35% on dairy products, up to 35% on dairy products. We heard Jeremy Hunt talking last week about a company in Kidderminster that had a, a 4% margin that would rise to 10%. He was actually right in economic terms. Um, but he, of course, said that he would have to stand by while 260 people lost their jobs, although he did tell us he'd have a heavy heart. So these are the same numbers, aren't they? This is, this is what we're talking about. Yes, these are very big numbers. Um, and the problem is, is that we, can, we simply can't lower tariffs um, just because we decide to do so after no deal, because the World Trade Organization stops you doing that, <laughs> because that would count as uh, kind of granting unfair privileged access to markets without going through the proper channels. Um, so Brexiteers who argue that we could leave under no deal and simply refuse to put up these trade barriers, uh, frankly, don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Kelsey Paris, um, to quote the Director General uh, as Avedo, Article 24 of the GATT is simply the provision of global trade law under which free trade agreements and customs unions are concluded. If there is no agreement, then Article 24 would not apply and the standard WHO terms would. Um, Alex, are there any grounds for thinking that the Director General of the World Trade Organization may have a poorer grasp of World Trade Organization terms than, say, Marc Francois or, or Nadine Dorries? That strikes me as very unlikely, uh, to, to put it uh, mildly. You should be a diplomat. We might be looking for a new ambassador to America. <laughs> so. um, and, and continuing with a slightly unprofessional line of questioning, you're, you're much younger than me. I, I know this because my producer commented on the fact that you're the same age when she was um, looking you up earlier, which means you've been doing journalism for a lot less long than I have. I, I'm, I'm staggered that this isn't the biggest story in town today. I, I'm genuinely gobsmacked that you're the first British journalist really to dig down into this. I, I interviewed Lammy before the referendum and, and the line that he's repeated to you about moving from the first division to the third division for, for no apparent reason still resonates. But just on a personal rather than a professional, or both actually, can, can you quite believe the scale of what the WTO top brass has told you gets of three percent of the amplification and coverage than the arrant nonsense being spoken about the WTO by people like Boris Johnson and, and Jacob Rees-Mogg and others. Does that comparison stagger you or have you managed to get your head around it? Basically, I think, um, it, you know, it, it's a shame and, and um, always I, of course, would like things, <laughs> things that we write to get, uh, you know, as much coverage as possible. I think we are a, a kind of bleak stage where misinformation reigns and yes. trying to cut through the fog with um, with interventions from people in the know is increasingly difficult uh, and I'm not I'm not sure who specifically is to blame no nor but am it I. Does, does seem that we've kind of got to a position uh, where we're actually in quite a dangerous place <laughs> and and I'm not sure what to do about it but you know hopefully Chipping away. Well, keep chipping. It, you know, bit by bit. Keep is, chipping. It, it and let, let me know if you ever need to borrow my loud hailer. I'll just finish with another quote from the chairman, a former chairman of the WTO's General Council. Again, there's no reason to suspect that he would understand the workings of the WTO's General Council better than Brexit hardman Steve Baker or Marc Francois. But he has said, and, and you've got him on the record, the effect of increased costs would be to make UK businesses less competitive with the risk that EU importers of goods and services might look elsewhere. Potential investors would also have to take these increased costs into account when deciding where to locate investments. That's probably the most mild of, of, of quotes in your entire article, isn't it? Uh, well, I mean, that shows just how much these people were, you know, willing to speak out. And, mm. and I think they're actually getting quite frightened now yes. um, as, as the 31st of October deadline. This isn't the EU getting frightened about the no deal. This is the WTO getting frightened about the no deal that no deal advocates tell us the WTO will save us from the worst impact of. Right. And I think as <laughs> deadline fast approaches and we kind of hurtle closer and closer towards the cliff edge, um, we are alarming, <laughs> alarming, sensible previous allies around the world of who are, are looking believe, on in disbelief. They can't believe it. Did, did you get any sense from them, final question, of surprise that, I mean, I don't know how many strings you had to pull or how many calls you had to make to get this access, but were you, were you surprised, did you sense from them any surprise that they're not being asked about this and not being invited to reveal this information more by the British media? 
actually, there was um, one thing that speaks directly to that, oh. which is um, I spoke to some people uh, who, you know, I'm thinking of using their quotes for kind of a, a follow-up article or something yes. who didn't quite make it into, into this one. And one of those was um, Roderick Abbott, who was Deputy Director General at the WTO. Um, and he... <laughs> He said he couldn't believe just how dire the level of debate was, basically. He, he, he found it, frankly, astounding, given Britain's position and what we're contemplating, that people don't know about uh, what the WTO is, how it works, um, you know, even where it is and who works there. Um, the fact that we're thinking of uh, crashing out of Europe and falling back on this institution, it astounded him, basically, that um, uh, we aren't all scrambling to become experts in it. I will retweet your article from, from my Twitter account. What's the prospect website for Is it up? Can people go and see it themselves? They absolutely can, uh, and please do. It's uh, prospectmagazine.co.uk. Um, oh, we've got lots of fantastic... fantastic and, um, and, and your man, Roderick Abbott, who despairs at the quality of debate regarding Brexit and the WTO in this country. I, I hope you steered him towards this programme, Alex. You know, that's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> exactly what I'm going to do when I go off the phone. <laughs> Top man, Alex Dean from Prospect Magazine has written an article that, uh, frankly, just completely demolishes everything you've been told about WTO by people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, by people like Boris Johnson, by people like Brexit hardman Steve Baker, by people like Mark Pudding Francois, by all of them. All of them. And I say it again. And I say it with such sincerity, it's not your fault. Even if you've got hashtag WTO now on your Twitter profile, these people were educated at the finest schools and the finest universities in the world. So when they have told you stuff, there is no shame in having believed it. But if you honestly think that the Director General of the World Trade Organization knows less about how the World Trade Organization works than Jacob Rees-Mogg or Brexit hardman Steve Baker or Mark Pudding Francois, then that's the point at which I can't help you anymore. It's 12.03. Fascinating to hear that journalist describe the difficulty of cutting through the fog. If you've spoken to the Director General of the World Trade Organization and you've spoken to the previous Director General of the World Trade Organization, you've spoken to a Deputy Director General, you've spoken to the head of a, of a body that operates within it and they've all told you the same story and then you turn on your television in Britain or your radio, I, I mean I have to stress it happens a lot on this radio station and someone is telling you utter nonsense about GAT 24 or about WTO terms in general, then, then you have to sympathise with journalists who are telling you facts and, and truth. Again, I stress it's not your fault. It's only when you have decided that you genuinely think on reflection that Marc Francois probably knows more about the WTO than the Director General of the WTO. That's the point at which you don't deserve sympathy. I'm so naive I still think people are going to wake up to this in time. Still. Speaking of which, Jeremy Corbyn has laid out his um, Brexit-related position, and we'll get stuck into that in a minute. But first, I'm just going to get some reaction to that WTO story from uh, some of the key advocates of, of WTO terms, the politicians who have essentially been making claims about the WTO and about Article 24 of GATT that the Director General of the World Trade Organization um, has just blown out of the water today. We'll, we'll start. We'll just get Andrea Leadsom's reaction first. That's words from a person. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you who will be very, very strong on this. Estimate, Vey. Uh, it's in one of the... Uh, 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 oh. And finally, Mark Francois. Mark, it, it turns out that the Director General of the World Trade Organization has described the thing that you've been telling voters will be good and fine... Um, it turns out that it's going to have an epic negative impact on almost every aspect of the British economy. It would be our choice. Oh, OK. I always think it's important to get dissenting voices on the programme. You choose now. Who do you trust? The Director General of the WTO or the three stooges that you just heard there? Eight minutes after 12 is the time. Speaking of stooges, Jeremy Corbyn has sent an email to all members. Shall I read it all? Shall I read the whole email or will people die of boredom? Okay, in the interest of fairness, I'll read the whole email, all right? Even if it takes us all the way up to quarter past. I am proud to... Dear member, 
I am proud to lead the Labour Party, the greatest political party and social movement in this country. We all recognise that the issue of Brexit has been divisive in our communities and sometimes in our party too. As Democrats, Labour accepted the result of the 2016 referendum. In our 2017 manifesto, Labour also committed to oppose a no-deal Brexit and the Tories' Brexit plans, which threaten jobs, living standards and the open multicultural society that we as internationalists value so much. I want to pay tribute to Keir Starmer and the shadow Brexit team for holding the government to account during this process. <laughs> that helped secure a meaningful vote on their deal, which we then defeated three times, including inflicting the largest ever defeat on any government, and following their refusal to publish their legal advice, this government became the first to be held in contempt of Parliament. Labour set out a compromise plan to try to bring the country together based around a customs union, a strong single market relationship, and protection of environmental regulations and rights at work. We continue to believe this is a sensible alternative that could bring the country together, but the Prime Minister refused to compromise and was unable to deliver so we ended cross-party talks. Now both Tory leadership candidates are threatening a no-deal Brexit or at best a race to the bottom and a sweetheart deal with Donald Trump. That runs us down industry, opens up our NHS and other public services to yet more privatisation and shreds environmental protections, rights at work and consumer standards. I have spent the past few weeks consulting with the Shadow Cabinet, MPs, affiliated unions and the NEC. I have also had feedback from members via the National Policy Forum consultation on Brexit. Whoever becomes a new Prime Minister should have the confidence to put their deal or no deal back to the people in a public vote. In those circumstances, I want to make it clear that Labour would campaign for Remain against either no deal or a Tory deal that does not protect the economy and jobs. Labour has a crucial historic duty to safeguard jobs, rights and living standards, but no Brexit outcome alone can do that. We need a general election. Hmm? After nine years of austerity, too many people in this country cannot find decent, secure, well-paid work and have to rely on public services that have been severely cut back. Our country is ravaged by inequality and rising poverty, huge regional imbalances of investment, and the government is failing to tackle the climate emergency facing us all. That is why we need a Labour government to end austerity and rebuild our country for the many, not the few. Yours, Jeremy Corbyn, aged 13 and three quarters. I've made up the last bit. Eleven minutes after twelve is the time. Go on then, just pick up the phone and explain it to me. 0345 6060 973. I suggested last week it was too late. Too late for this man to lead any form of Remain campaign, any form of sec second referendum campaign. Three years sitting on his hands, picking his nose, doing the bidding of his increasingly sinister closest aides. I, 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 I've spent my life since the referendum was called saying I hope I'm wrong. And, and I'm sure I have been, but, but on Jeremy Corbyn, I really hope I'm wrong. I, I, I hope, as he raises his standard, I'm still confused, but I'm as much in danger of seeing what I want to see as anybody else is. Whoever becomes the new Prime Minister should have the confidence to put their deal, or no deal, back to the people in a public vote. In those circumstances, I want to make it clear that Labour would campaign for Remain against either no deal or a Tory deal that does not protect the economy and jobs. And then we need a general election. I want, I want to make it clear that Labour would campaign for Remain against either No Deal or a Tory deal. We need a general election. 03456060973. Is Jeremy Corbyn pro or anti Brexit after this astonishingly clarifying? Intervention. 03456060973 is the number you need. Um, I, I, I want also to talk to people, I, I presume we're all Remainers now, right? After hearing that WTO story just before the news, nobody with a functioning cerebral cortex could still think that crashing out on WTO terms was anything other than a disaster. How do you know that, James? Because the head of the WTO just said so. So presumably we're all Remainers now. Does this please you? Does it excite you? Has Jeremy Corbyn risen slightly in your estimation by clearing this up so completely? Or are you slightly more confused than you were before I read you this email to all members? It's a genuine question. 0345 6060 What exactly is Labour's position now? Is it the same as it was last year? Is it different from what it was last year? Is it the same as what it will be next year? Are, are they, are they, are, is it, is it if, if there's no general election, then we want a second referendum? 
How, how will they campaign? Oh, we'll back Remain against either No Deal or a Tory deal, but you don't know what the Tory deal is yet. And what happens if you end up in Parliament, in, in government? What would a Labour deal look like? And how would you get that through the House of Commons if it's markedly different from what's already been agreed with the European Union? How would you get the European... I've got more questions than answers at the moment, but I completely accept that I may be skewed slightly in my view of Jeremy Corbyn as an absolute clown shoe, OK? So if you are still seeing the light in your view, talk me through what has happened today. Because I do this stuff for a living and I haven't got a clue. Simple question. I've just read you the entire email that Jeremy Corbyn has sent to all Labour members. I want you to tell me first and foremost whether Jeremy Corbyn is pro-Remain or pro-Brexit. OK? Because he's, he's cleared things up apparently in this email. So is he pro-Remain or pro-Brexit now? 03456060973. And what do you think of him? Actually, we haven't done that for a while. Is he, is he growing in your estimation? Uh, do you think this tactic of trying to play both sides off against each other is paying off as his personal approval ratings, according to most pollings, um, uh, uh, I mean, about as close to the floor as it's possible to be without being an actual snake? Let's find out. Alex is in Mill Hill. Pro or anti-Brexit, Alex? Well, I, I think he, he, he's, a, he's a Democrat. Uh, that, that's how I would answer the question. Sorry, you must, you must have misheard me. I didn't say, is he a Democrat or not a Democrat? I said, is he pro or anti-Brexit? Yeah, but I don't accept that wind, that, that uh, framing. Uh, well, again, I must apologise. You've, you've got slightly the wrong end of the stick about how radio phone yeah. programmes work. Here's me asking a question. Here's you ringing in to answer it. Is Jeremy Corbyn pro or anti-Brexit? Well, I'm trying to answer you. And Good. I'm saying, from, right, so it's one or the, the other. Letter, one or the other. That, well, from the letter, I don't think you can say he's either. That's the thing. Same because here. the letter, yeah, because the letter is saying, which is good, because oh, is it? The country, well, so yeah, if, I, if I want, if I want someone who's anti-Brexit, you've just told me he's not my man, and if I want someone who's pro-Brexit, you've just told me he's not my man, and that's good. Talk me through that. Well, I'll try to. I know you're anti-Brexit. I've listened to you enough to know that, and I'm, my point is that. We can't continue as a country to be living in two camps. So at some point, people are going to have to be pulled together. And nobody in either of those two camps is probably going to get everything they want. So the sooner adults get into the room and start operating on that basis, the sooner the matter... Yeah, I'm, going to, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I'm going to ask you again. How is it good that he's appealing to precisely nobody? He, he is appealing to people because who? I'm I'm somebody who voted Remain. Yes. And I, and I accept that we had a referendum. I didn't like the result. But I think that it is the duty of the politicians to find a way through So that. he's pro-Brexit but, then? To me? No, he is. No, I don't think he's pro-Brexit. You've just described his position as good and yourself as someone who thinks that the result of the referendum needs to be respected. So he's pro-Brexit. Uh, just because you respect the referendum, it doesn't mean we'll end up leaving. Because but how do you respect the referendum vote? without leaving? Because uh, you follow through to find a It's a terrible Patrick. phone line. I feel sorry for you. Uh, I feel sorry for people listening because they're not going to be able to hear sorry, your polls. I'll, I'll, I'll get back into it. I'm saying you follow through, you try and get so the he's, deal. So he's pro-Brexit you know, you put that deal back to the public. You give right. them an opportunity to vote on the deal. If you follow through and you get a deal, then the public can't say you haven't tried to achieve Brexit. Right. Because so, that's what people ask for. So it, uh, <laughs> in the absence of a general election that Labour win, is he pro or anti-Brexit? But I think, you're, you're, with all due respect, I think you're not... You're, you're trying to put people into camp when yeah. you actually need to be thinking more intelligently okay. about... Okay, well, with, with all that. due respect to you... No, sorry, there's none due at all. Ian is in Bridlington. Ian, what would you like to say? James, hi, how are you doing? All good. Um, the reason for the call really was to say that, um, to me, Jeremy Corbyn is, is definitely in favour of uh, leaving the EU. Of course he is. And this document, really, all it does is it pulls together the different views within the Labour Party and tries to satisfy them all. It just sort of sounds like somebody sat on a fence and said, right, what do you want to say in the letter from the sort of the pro-Brexit to the the sort of people that want to sort of remain? And they just cumbled it together, they chucked it in a letter, sent it out there, and 
to me, the divisions are still there. It doesn't matter whether it's Labour or Conservative. The divisions are such that it's not winnable. And I've said this from the word go, even amongst my friends. Oh, we could still we could still come out on, on terms described by the former Director General of the WTO as moving from the First League to the Third League. But, but coming out with anything that can be sold to the British public as an improvement on what we've currently got, while simultaneously retaining a semblance of reality is is impossible but I, I i i want to make it clear he says you seem to be suggesting that he hasn't made it clear ian no he's not i think it's just as muddled i mean can you make any sense of that wording that you just read in about those circumstances in those circumstances so whoever becomes the new prime minister should have the confidence to put their deal or no deal back to the people in a public vote in those circumstances, I want to make it clear that Labour would campaign for Remain again. What if they don't put it back to a public vote? What's Labour's position then? Well, we both know that um, whoever comes in, the Prime Minister, are not going to put it back to the public because if they do, they're going to get hammered in the polls. They need some time to see it through and come up with a few gold stars and say to the public... They haven't got any time. They've got October the 31st. Yeah, no, but what I'm saying is they'll, they'll sort of... Look, these politicians are not interested in you or I. They're only interested in their own... Um, their some own some are, some aren't. Tom Watson, the deputy yeah. leader of the Labour Party, has unequivocally come out for both a people's vote and for remaining. Why do you think Jeremy Corbyn can't do that? Because it's fundamentally what he doesn't believe in. He would say it's because of Labour-held seats in, in the north of England. Uh, the statistics don't back him up completely, but there must be something in it. It's because of Labour-held seats, people like Caroline Flint's seat, that it, it would be vulnerable to the, to the um, uh, Brexit company, and it would be um, uh, Labour losses that might stop them getting a majority in the government. So at some point, as I read it, even if you were to accept that sophology, at some point he's going to have to choose. Isn't he? But I mean, look, in, in any, this is what I said before, there's no, you, you can't, you can't sort of, there's no middle ground. And what you've just said there, they're going to lose some seats in the north because if he comes out and says we're leaving, you're remaining, going to get people remaining, in Bolton. remaining, remaining, remaining. Yeah, remaining, remaining. Sorry, you're going to get people in Bolton who are very staunchly sort of let's get out yes. for whatever reason, and it's a good, strong heartland for Labour. Um, that they're going to sort of they're going to vote somewhere else. They're going to vote for every Brexit. Caroline Flint. Oh. You've got an Anna Turley, of course, who is putting the um, uh, concerns and priorities and welfare of her constituents ahead. of of her electoral chances at, at the next general election. I, I don't know. I, I don't know who the leader of our party is, but it doesn't look like Jeremy Corbyn. But and there's the, there's the issue. You see, that's he's trying to satisfy somebody on the left, somebody in the middle, somebody on the right. When in actual fact, Brexit, and you've said this before in many of your programmes, <laughs> it's either a leave or stay. There's no real in between. Of course there isn't. And this is what we're finding. We're getting down to this 31st of October, and it's sort of, let's, let's go back to Europe. Well, I'm sorry, but they're all on holiday. Yes, and also they're you know? repeating themselves till they're blue in exactly. the blinking face, as opposed to blue in the flag or blue in the passport. So would you, if you were, if you were a, a, a you know, if you were a member of the European government, would you talk to us? Because I wouldn't. No. There's, you know, there's no no reason to. I mean, you've highlighted the issue with industry. Also, you've got the fella now who's been, he's called them concentration camp guards, the one who's likely to be the next prime. He's going to look them in the eye and yeah. make them believe that we're going to leave with no deal. And they're going to turn around and say, we published 93 notices about our preparations for no deal in, I think, 2017. Yeah, well, I mean, I preparations for a no deal, what does that mean? I don't think that, that do, do they exist. If only we could find out what the Director General of the World Trade Organization thinks about the uh, wisdom or otherwise of, of a no deal. 26 minutes after 12. Thank you, Ian. Is Jeremy Corbyn pro or anti Brexit? Fair play to Alex in Mill Hill for trying to say both and neither at the same time. That's what he's done to his supporters. That's what Jeremy Corbyn has done to his fans, you see. It's exactly what Farage has done to his fans. He's turned them into people who are now being told to ignore the evidence of their own eyes. Oh, we'll come out on WTO terms and everything will be splendid. Here's the Director General of the WTO calling you a clown shoe. Well, he's just got to believe more. Or, um, or of course, as, as Andrea Leadsom might say... That's words from a person. <laughs> An absolute masterclass in articulacy compared to Esther McVeigh. Uh, it's in one of the... Uh, 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 
And finally, Mark Pudding Francois explaining why it's a good idea to move, as Pascal Lamy puts it, from League One to League Three. It would be our choice. Jay's in Sheffield. Jay, is Jeremy Corbyn pro or anti Brexit? I would say he's pro Brexit. Go on. Uh, but by the way, James, I'm a big fan. Sorry, I had to say that. That's um, right. Big, big you fan. I listen to you every to. day. Oh, bless you. Um, Thank you, mate. You didn't come and see um, me in Sheffield, though, did you? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I was in Sheffield. I was in Sheffield about a month ago. You could have just said, no, James, it was sold out. All oh, right. I didn't even know, mate. I probably wouldn't have done no, anyway. I'm obviously not plugging my personal appearances enough on the programme. Memo to self, write this down, Keith. More plugs. I'll tell you about my book if you're good, Jay. But no, I'm more interested in why you rang in. Uh, yeah, I think that um, Jeremy Corbyn is a Brexiteer. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's why he's sitting on the fence. I think he just doesn't want to be sort of the face of Brexit. Uh, he doesn't want to be blamed for it if anything goes wrong. But he very much wants Brexit to happen. Um, he does, doesn't he? He, to... he? he totally does, doesn't he? And I think some of his, his core support are now pretending that they're cool with that. It's why they end up saying, I wanted to remain, but I respect the result of the referendum, but I don't think we will actually have to leave, like the poor fellow who came on first this hour. Who I think, I may be misremembering, but I think he used to be at the front of the queue to cheerlead for Corbyn whenever the subject came up on my programme and others. And, and, and he's put these people in such contorted positions that they could almost get a job in the circus. Yeah. That's human string. What would you do? Yeah. What would you want him to do? What would get him to... What would? What could he do that would get you cheering him to the rafters? Uh, I don't think that I would support him or vote for him, but I would respect him if he said, look, I'm a Brexiteer, this yeah. is really what I want. And, yeah, just be honest. If he was honest about it, I'd be like, okay, fair play, that's your stance. All right, cool, there you go. Let me tell um, you. Yes. I wouldn't personally vote for it, but at least I know where you stand. Uh, and, and, and then I, I suppose you'd leave all this ground clear for the for the Lib Dem surge or the centrist revival that the country is clearly crying out for, um, which is why he won't do it. And and yet, yeah, can we check those last personal? It's only a poll. I'm not by any means suggesting that polls are are, are, are pure science, but they're the only indicators we have. The, the last one on personal popularity, personal prime ministerial approval. I know he got he was beat, he was overtaken by the don't knows years ago. I think he's now losing quite a lot to someone who's already resigned as Prime Minister. I, 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 surely there's a point at which you go, like in that famous Mitchell and Webb sketch, where they're dressed as Nazis and, and, and David turns to Robert and goes, are we the baddies? It's half past twelve. I, one of the great regrets I have about this uh, so-called career is that I can't swear. Not only can I not swear on the radio, but I also very, very, very rarely swear on Twitter. I swore on Twitter the other day and then I deleted it because someone else made exactly the same point without swearing. And I am a huge fan of creative swearing. Uh, I, I, I really am a huge... Uh, so are you if you enjoy, for example, Malcolm Tucker in the thick of it. So I, I say this with great consideration. Uh, our friend Ian Dunt of, of politics.co.uk... He, he is a Malcolm Tucker-esque swearer. He is an absolute da Vinci of swearing. And I urge you to, to follow him on Twitter to see his latest masterpieces. Obviously, I can't refer you directly to those, but I can refer you to this rather pithy little description of what Jeremy Corbyn has just done. The sweet spot of electoral nothing. Brexiters will find it too Remainy, Remainers to Brexity. And there it is in a nutshell. Alongside a reminder that Jeremy Corbyn recently um, dipped below Michael Foote on the records, this is from Ipsos Mori, of the least popular uh, opposition leader on record. So is he pro-Brexit or no Brexit? Mark's in Thornton Heath. Mark, what do you think? Uh, I think that Corbyn is clearly and obviously pro-EU, and he has been for quite a while. He stopped when, when did he start voting being? against it in 2011-12. And like nearly all Labour lefties, they've become more pro-EU. So what votes... The what EU votes became more democratic. What votes has he done that suggests he's pro-EU? Uh, everything since then. Yeah, just, I, just, I told you, 2011-12. Yeah, but I don't have the memory to recall what those votes were. Are you talking about when he became leader? No, I'm talking about any, since 2011, 2012, the votes that display his... That's when he stopped voting against... So what's he voted for since? 
Uh, well, I'm saying that's when he stopped speaking and voting against the I know, EU. but what votes have happened since then? Because it would be helpful, evidence-wise, for me to say to people who think that he's Brexiter, which I do myself, it would be helpful for me to change my own position. What votes has he done that could be construed as supportive of the EU in its current form? It's, it's what he, he's said and spoken. At meetings, I saw him early 2015 in a meeting, and I'm strongly remain, always have been, and always been against Ben and all those people are anti no, no, I, no, I know all that, but I'm interested in the specific votes that you point to as evidence of his support for the EU. I don't have that in front of me. He I must have one. In front of me. You're on national radio. You must have one. One what? One vote that proves the point you're making. I'm saying that he stopped... No, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. I'm just saying name one vote that, that, that demonstrates your point. Are you just uh, trying to make it difficult for me because I'm saying... I'm trying to make it easier for me to understand you. Yeah, I am saying that he is pro-you. He's, he's and, and I'm saying which votes demonstrate it. Result, all of this stuff. Okay. Well, let's, I'll, I'll take that as read. He, he, his votes yeah. display an enthusiasm for the European Union. What will the Labour's Brexit... I say his votes are, because it depends on how many come and how you interpret it. What? Like, in, uh, whenever it was 2011, Caroline Lucas voted for a referendum. Yeah. But she's strongly... Why, why are we talking you? about Caroline Lucas? Because she had a vote which some people would interpret of as being anti-EU. Right. But it wasn't anti-EU. Because she is pro you. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not friend. asking you about Caroline Lucas. No, you're asking me about votes in Parliament. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is going well. What's Labour's Brexit policy in the next general election? Leave or remain? Is, is this anything to do with your question? Because your question was whether he's pro EU. Yes. Or anti EU. No, no, no. Or my question was whether about... he is pro Brexit or anti Brexit. I haven't actually said EU in the context oh, of this calling. Yeah, so, so the Labour leader, who in your view is a staunch Remainer, as is evidenced by all the votes he's cast that can be construed as supporting the EU. No, I didn't say that. Oh, what well, you I did? I said from everything he has said. Oh, but not votes then, just things he said. Whatever votes came Okay, up. so this pro this pro Remain Labour leader, what do you think the Labour Party's pop? Well, you mustn't. I mean, obviously, I can. I think I can conclude from that that you think Labour will campaign at the next general election on a call-off Brexit platform. I don't know that because they haven't agreed their manifesto. But he's a staunch Remainer. He is, and he's the leader. He is pro Remain and reform. Right. So that will be the manifesto pledge at the next but, election. Uh, you don't understand that the leader... I know, I'm really party. struggling here. Why wasn't but, that the manifesto pledge at the last election? Because Labour, unfortunately, when Harriet Harman changed Labour policy, which I remember vividly, yes. to support Cameron's uh, referendum, and I regret that day that she changed the policy, Labour, having participated in the referendum, promised they'd respect the result. And why and would that change now? 2017. So, now we so, know more, it's very hard to get a reasonable outcome and certainly now the Tories are heading for two terrible outcomes. And Corbyn is pro-Remain because... Personally, he is pro-Remain, pro-EU, Remain or Reform. Right. And that's I, clear from everything he said and his actions, but I, not... I, your... I, I couldn't disagree with you more. Everything I've seen him say and everything I've... I, I don't have the votes to hand any, any more than you do, but I don't want to read too much into that. I, I can't see anything that I would describe, any speech he's ever made, any comment he's ever delivered, that I would describe as enthusiasm for the European Union. Yeah, he regretted the result. Did he? He's, he campaigned I, for I, I, Listen, you. Mark, this is anecdotal rather than evidential, yeah. which I don't normally like, but I can, you can take my word for the source is absolutely impeccable. I, I know someone who was with him on the night that the result came in, and he did not look regretful. Um... I, th I think there is this sort of myth that he is uh, pro-Brexit, a secret Brexiteer. And I think this myth gets propagated and gets repeated uh, and uh, people uh, start believing it. I, I, I think that's why I've come after you like a bear with a sore head <laughs> this afternoon, for which I'm going to apologise, because I, I don't think it is a myth, but I, but I don't have any more proof for my position, except the absence of enthusiasm, than you have for yours. I, I just wanted something that I could hang my hat well, on and well, say... there is something... So evidence, which yes. is Labour MPs, you know, I remember in 80, well, even 75, that rubbish referendum I had to vote in, mm. and another cynical referendum, just like Cameron's, mm. um, Labour Party MPs, slightly more than the majority, were anti-EEC. And over the years, 
the... But I don't think he's one of the ones that has moved. It's, it's, it's the Benite tendency that I think he represents. It's... But, they, but they've moved, you see. I don't think he has. I don't think he has. Labour voters and members, which I've never been, no. uh, they have become pro-EU as it became more democratic, better for workers' rights and better for the environment. And hardly any are left. The number of Lexiteers and Labour MPs is minimal. I, 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 do you know, I think I envy you. he's one of them. I think that's I, moved. No, I don't think he is. I, I, I really don't think he is. And, and yet, I don't think either of us can prove our point to the satisfaction of the other person. Well, I, pr I proved it to myself when yes. I went, you know, I thought, that my son point, uh, booked a, to go and hear him speak. Mm. Said, oh, this guy, interesting policies, go and hear him. And I went, and I'm very strongly pro-Remain, always have been. And uh, he, that was what I was looking for. Now, it didn't come out in his speech at the time, but he got asked that question. And it was clear, and especially as he tends to be a very genuine sort of guy. Oh, come on. Uh, did, did you watch Panorama last night? Of being very genuine. All right, go on. That may have been damaged since he's been leader, but that was it before. You know, not for his own good, not someone seeking to climb the greasy pole. And he, he was pro-you. Now, that's anecdotal, because that's my view. I heard him, but then so did however many people were there hear him. And he's been pro-you. And the idea that he's in a pro-EU uh, Labour cabinet and a secret Brexiteer trying to manipulate everything so that we exit isn't true. I I, I, well, I, I, you know, I, I don't do this often enough on the programme. I'm going to politely part with you in complete disagreement. I think he is absolutely desperate to leave the European Union with the Conservative Party carrying the can for things going wrong and a clear canvas for him to reconstruct his... Can I just say one little thing? Of course then? you can. May, I, I know you have that view, and I've seen it, and I like the fact you're very strongly pro you, pro anti Brexit, and everything. Mm. And you have followed your stuff, but that I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding about Corbyn, and I think you need to try and you know you have access to people that know him. Well, exactly. And uh, and and they are. I, I do, I do, I mean, I can't embarrass anybody by yeah, know, dropping yeah, names or, or, or revealing anything, but, but I haven't heard this position as espoused by you today from any of them. Right. But I'll ask them, I'll ask them specifically, actually. Yeah. And can I give you some advice? Yeah. Can I recommend David Kogan's history of the Labour Party that's just been published, uh, the, the Power and the Glory? Uh, how do you spell the last name? K-O-G-A-N. Right. Okay. And we'll compare notes on that next time you call in. And can I apologise for being a little bit brusque with you earlier? No, no, that's fine. I, I expect you to be. Well, I, I know you do, but some people don't. And, and, and occasionally, yeah. occasionally it's undeserved. And this yeah. is what I mean, I'm saying from my point of view, following, you know, like a lot of the politics of the people on the left of the Labour Party, yes. but the anti-EC put me right off them. No, I, well, I can get that as well. I'm just intrigued by the notion that Corbyn has abandoned that position and, and moved to a position of enthusiasm, given that almost everybody I know who, who would fall into the Remain camp or the passionately anti-Brexit camp is, um, is convinced that he's the enemy. That doesn't mean we're right. I'm not going to say it for the seventh gazillionth time. It's 12.45. A lot of love for that estimate of a clip. We can't overplay it though. All of those kind of little radio um, moments of magic lose their appeal if they are overused. But, you know, whenever we have a massive... EU-related story. We shall consult the opinions of the three uh, experts, Andrea Ledson, Mr. McVeigh and Mark Francois. And today, the story is that the head of the WTC... What do you do now if you are someone who's been telling me for the last, what, three months that you did vote for WTO terms? And, and it is categorically, you knew what you were voting for. Anyone who suggests otherwise is a condescending, sneering, public schoolboy Ramona. And... Um, and now the head of the WTO has said this is an absolute disaster. The head of the WTO has said that. See, something happened on the show yesterday. I don't know if you were listening. And I think it was quite significant. It wasn't... I, I would say it was as significant as Steve, who rang in about a month ago, to explain that he is comfortable with Donald Trump's lies because it winds up people like me. And then we had another call yesterday from someone who used the phrase people like you. And it was from an American caller who told me categorically, you can find it on the website, stop telling the truth about Donald Trump. And that I think is what happens next with Brexit. I think stop telling the truth.
is the next message. You've kind of seen it already when Dominic Raab tries to pretend that people like me think that the people he's conned are stupid. He says, oh, well, James thinks you're stupid, James thinks this, James thinks that. No, categorically not. Anyone who listens to this programme knows. Compassion for the conned, contempt for the con men. But stop telling the truth. So, Because how else do you square the fact that you've been pushed into a position where you've been claiming in public, and not just the ones with the hashtags on their Twitter accounts, but all over the country, people claiming in public that they knew they were voting for WTO terms, right? How do you square that with the fact that pretty much everybody involved with the WTO, either historically or currently, has described the prospect of that type of Brexit in the most negative of terms? So you've been put in a position now where you're saying, I voted for the WTO Brexit that the WTO say is stupid. And again, that's not fair. And it's not your fault. But that's where you are now. I voted for a WTO Brexit that the WTO says is stupid, but Jacob says it'll be great. I don't think, I think that might be a new watermark. I really do, because I, I don't see how you can continue to engage in rational conversation now. I voted for a WTO Brexit that the WTO say is rubbish. So either you now admit the con, admit the mistake, or you start telling people to shut up and stop telling the truth. For example, the head of the WTO. What, is there a third way there? Shut up and stop telling the truth, which we got on a Trump phone in yesterday. And where Trump leads, Brexit always follows. Or, of course I didn't vote for a WTO Brexit that the WTO Director General has described in the most negative of terms. Of course I didn't. I'm so sorry. And I'm going to reserve my ire and my resentment for the people that not only persuaded me to vote for Brexit, but the people who have latterly been claiming that leaving on WTO terms would be a very, very good idea, or, or absolutely fine, or wonderful. I don't, I don't, I don't, and I'm about a student of these mental contortions. How can you do that? How can you say, I definitely voted for the WTO Brexit that the WTO Director General thinks is daft? I do not know. Um, pointed out quite a few of you in the context of the last call with Mark that being anti-Brexit and pro-EU are not the same thing. And that's a very, very good point. Richard is in Asher. Richard, is he pro, well, actually, anti-Brexit, pro-Brexit, pro-EU, EU, anti-EU? Where, where, where does Jeremy Corbyn sit in your view? <laughs> well, James, um, first time caller. Um, You're very welcome. Th thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, I was listening to your last caller um, with quite a lot of interest, actually. Um, uh, and uh, as you said, is this, is this, is this a view that people take away from private meetings, hustings? Is it something, is it a view that's, is it a feeling that's given out very, very differently to what is given out in general to the public? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm baffled because... Well, I think the Benite position, and it, 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 again, I'm open to correction on this, would be that we want to leave the political institutions, but not necessarily the trade agreement. And, and that might explain this in constant insistence that, that we can sort of have our cake and eat it. It's doable on EEA and EFTA terms, I suppose, but not once you've brought Theresa May's red lines in. So I, I don't know. I think we're both groping around in the dark. See, see, I think, I think this could, Jeremy Corbyn could clear this all up in, in two well, seconds. Yes. And he could have done from the start. Yes. Um, you and I both know, I think, that all he has to do, is, if, if he wanted to, was be honest and say, look, I'm wanting out of the EU. Um, but uh, it, I, but I can do that. If we have to stay in, in the EU, I want to do it in my terms. If we can't do it in my terms, then if we have to, we can stay. I think I think he, there's a slight narcissism there, where he still believes that we can have, as you said, your cake and eat it, and he's the man to do that. And um, and if the Tories won't let him have a shot at that, then he'll, you know reluctantly campaign to remain but I just think he thinks he can get out of the EU in far better terms than... Yeah I do as well I do as well um, 
without any justification or evidence for that position. Any no, sympathy no. for the idea that he can't become a, a, a full-throated Remainer because of people like Caroline no. Flint? And the, no, the... no, no, no. Jeremy really? Corbyn, as I, as I say, I think Jeremy Corbyn does it Jeremy Corbyn's way. Um, and I, I, I think there's vote counting up the, 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 up the north of England, etc. I, I don't think he, he's as calculated as that. I think he's more simplistic. I think if he wanted to stay in the EU and he was pro-EU, he would, he would just say, look, this is what Labour's doing. This is what's good for us. This is what we're doing. I, th I, I don't think he's that calculating. Although I do think he, you know, he would maybe sway a little bit if he got the chance for being in power, and he'd give up a few of his uh, his bits and pieces back there. Ah, uh, you could be right. Um, speaking of Brexit, I, I have the rather grim duty of bringing you the latest pronouncements from Donald Trump, the President of the United States of America. Now, Donald Trump's admirers and supporters in this country, you will remember were incandescent with rage when Barack Obama accepted an invitation from a British Prime Minister to comment on our trade prospects in the event of leaving the European Union. And Barack Obama broke all the rules, according to Donald Trump's admirers in this country, when he said, uh, gave his considered opinion, that it would put us at the back of the queue as far as he was concerned as American president. You don't need me to mention names, Nigel Farage, of people who were absolutely furious at this perceived interference in our affairs from a foreign politician, okay? So if you see any of those people today, you, you, I, I would advise you to tread very carefully because they are going to be furious. Donald Trump's just tweeted this, and I wish I was joking. I think by now you know I'm not. The wacky ambassador that the UK foisted upon the United States is not someone we are thrilled with. A very stupid guy. I imagine, for example, that Kim Darroch doesn't believe that aeroplanes were around in 1776. He should speak to his country and Prime Minister May about their failed Brexit negotiation and not be upset with my criticism of how badly it was handled. I told Theresa May how to do that deal but she went her own foolish way, was unable to get it done. A disaster. Donald Trump's advice, as far as anybody is aware, is that he told Theresa May she should sue the EU. I, I, I'm not currently au fait with any advancement or elaboration upon that advice. Um, I don't know the ambassador, but have been told he is a pompous fool. Good grief, thank God he's not interfering in British politics or diplomatic relations, because that would be awful. I mean, imagine if he'd, if he'd said something about the prospects of a future trade deal at the invitation of the British Prime Minister. That would be really bad, right? The wacky ambassador that the UK foisted upon the United States is not someone we are thrilled with. And we're back to Steve. Why, why do you let him get away with this stuff? He's maligning our country, he's insulting our traditions, he's mocking our Prime Minister, he's insulting the office of... of Prime Minister and the incumbent. Oh, because it really annoys anti-racists, James. That's it. That's it. As I said at the end of the first hour, if you're not worried about the future, now, <laughs> you will be by the end of the show.